Merhaba. It's wonderful to be back in my favorite city. But wow, a lot has changed since I was here 18 months ago. So all the concepts you've heard about today, gamification, disruptive innovation, how to manage a football team, all of these plus an understanding of how to apply brain science can take you as an individual and an HR professional to the next level in terms of being seen as strategic and commercial. Because from a neuroscience point of view, being smart isn't always about making things more complex. Sometimes, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. When your business and your industry have been under pressure for longer than you can remember, when the financial climate is still uncertain, and when your very borders are being challenged, don't ask people to change something by 10%. Ask them if they can change 10 things by 1%. There are so many simple little things that you can do to give yourself an edge, not only over your competition, but indeed to perform better than you usually do, even in the toughest of times. My favorite example of unleashing creativity through resource cutting is the Danish dogma film industry. They took away more and more things that you were allowed to do to make a film, and you know, if you've seen any Scandic noir movies, then I think you can see that it's been pretty successful. So I said there were many little things that you could do to improve your performance at work and in life. Here's one thing that I suggest you do every morning. Why? Because of loss aversion in the brain. It's actually one of the strongest gearings in our brain. We are much more likely to go to lengths to avoid a loss than we are to get a reward. So that means that every unfinished task on your mind, all those emails that will be waiting for you at the end of today, the fact that you might be tired, hungry, stressed, excited, all of those things, physical and mental, keep coming to the front of your mind and distracting you from the task that you actually want to focus on. So they remove simplicity from your system. And we're already being bombarded with information by technology 24 hours a day. Some people even say that the rise in adult ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and autism spectrum disorders is caused by the fact that we're having so much technology bombarding us with information on a continual basis. We, in fact, receive more information in a day now than we did in a lifetime when we lived in caves. So the thing about this exercise is it's best done in the morning. It's a little bit late in the day to ask you to do it now. But you must either write these things down or speak them out loud to somebody else. If you just let these thoughts go round and round in your mind, then you're not actually getting them off your sort of distraction list. The other major thing I want you to remember from neuroscience about keeping things simple is the brain-body connection. Even though psychology has informed business for decades, we act as if there's a cutoff here and that what goes on in our minds has no effect on our bodies and that the state of our body, our physical condition, doesn't affect our quality of thinking. Well, actually, these things are obviously part of a complex dynamic system. Being in peak physical condition, just like the football manager said, the footballers have to refuel, load themselves up, rest. So do we. The physical condition of our body affects our memory, our concentration, our decision making, and our leadership ability. So when you make your list, write down everything physical that could be distracting you as well as anything mental. So what are the things that we want to be able to do with our brain at its best? We want to be able to regulate our emotions. Complex emotions and a lot of emotion can actually drain us physically and mentally, but having just the right amount of emotion to make the best decision is where we want to be. 
We also need to suppress our unconscious biases. When we're under pressure, when there's so much information coming at us that we have to disregard what's not important, we have to focus on what's important and filter it in terms of order of importance, we have to admit to ourselves that when we're not at our best, even if we think we don't have an ageist, racist, or sexist bone in our bodies, if these stereotypes exist in the world, then they are, to some extent, so what we call soft-wired into our brains. So we tend to think that these biases are just to do with how we see other people, or perhaps with how other people perceive us. But actually, in terms of mind over matter, or this brain-body connection, it's about how we perceive ourselves. So let me give you an example using myself as, as the person. So, and it's, quite, it's usually the least offensive thing to do rather than picking on someone. Um, and I'm a good example because I'm female and I'm not white. So if I was going for a job interview, let's say, let's pick one of the corporate sponsors, Yappy Credit. So at a bank, and it was a job where I had to be very numerate. If just before the interview, somebody said to me, I love your dress, where did you get it from? That would just vaguely remind me that I'm female, and I would then be likely to underperform compared to my ability in that interview, because the stereotype in the world is that women aren't as good with numbers as men. If, however, just before the same interview, someone asked me where in India my parents came from, I would be likely to overperform in that interview because the stereotype in the world is that Asian people are good with numbers. Now, how did we find this out? And you know, how scary is it that one comment can actually change the way that you perform? So we first of all did some experiments on Harvard medical students, so healthy, young, intelligent volunteers. They were asked to walk between five rooms that had words on pieces of paper on a table in those rooms. And they thought that they just had to make a sentence out of those words. But the real experiment was that one of the rooms had the words beach, bungalow, Florida, walking, sunshine. And if you're American, then that makes you vaguely think of retirement. Over 85% of the students walked more slowly out of that room than any of the rooms, regardless of what order they entered the rooms. So we took these experiments further. How much more can your mental attitude affect your physical condition, and vice versa. We took three groups of people in their 80s, so lovely old people, and um, one group just carried on living like they usually do. One group were told, pretend like you're in your 60s, just act like you did 20 years ago. And the third group actually had their homes retrofitted so that they looked like they did 20 years ago. If they didn't have glasses or a walking frame 20 years ago, it was just taken away from them for two weeks. At the end of two weeks, the third group had improved visual acuity and musculoskeletal coordination. Now, I, of course, told this to my optician, who said to me, he's also Asian and the same age as me. He said, Tara, you might look young, but you're getting to that age where you're starting to get long-sighted. So I said, that's not going to happen to me. He said, we'll see in a year. So I came back for my eye test recently, and um, I said, you know, I just, I haven't been changing anything that I do. If I can't read something, I don't move it further away to make it easier for me. I just carry on. And he um, did my test and said, oh my goodness, Tara, your scores have actually improved. So objectively, my scores had improved. And then he wanted to know, how much attention did you pay to this? And I said, no, I just told you last year that it's not going to happen to me, and then I just didn't change my behavior, even though I could have made life easier for myself. Um, and that was actually quite a simple thing to do, because I was just really stubborn and kept doing what I always do. Um, OK, so that's all about mind over matter and biases that exist in the world. Task switching is actually a real gift. No human brain is good at multitasking. There is a bit of a myth that female brains are better at multitasking than male brains. But actually, when we multitask, we do each task less well than we can do that task individually. So what you kind of want to learn to do is to focus on being logical and technical for a certain amount of time, 
and then actually move your thinking to a more creative or empathic or intuitive way of thinking. Because what's actually going on in the brain when you do that is that the blood flow is moving to the system of thinking that you're trying to use the most. So when you're trying to be really logical, you're actually moving the blood flow away from the communicative, empathic parts of your brain. And then the other higher functions of the brain are things like solving complex problems, thinking flexibly and adaptably. You know, why do we even want to bring simplicity into our lives? Well, it's actually because it can help us to tolerate change in future. And of course, the pinnacle of our thinking is the fact that we can predict and plan for the future and be creative and innovative. So what do we have to put in to try to get these things out? It's quite simple, really. Um, we have to rest our brains. So 98 to 99% of human brains need seven to nine hours of sleep per night. If you had any sleep disturbance last night, you are operating on an IQ loss of five to eight points today. Now, anyone in this room could carry on their job perfectly well with five to eight IQ points less than they normally have. But if you've lost a whole night's sleep, and that could just be an overnight flight, or it could be because you have young children, then a population, population norm studies show a standard deviation drop in IQ, which would put all of us at below normal IQ. And I have so many clients that basically boast about staying awake all night on deals for night after night, and I say to them, that's like coming in to work drunk. You wouldn't slap each other on the back and congratulate each other for that, but that's essentially what you're doing. And then, of course, there are the longer-term implications of not getting at least eight hours sleep a night, which is that there's a long cleansing process of our brain, which is very active, and it flushes out neurotoxins. If we don't allow that process to happen regularly, we see more of the protein plaques and tangles like you see in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Glucose. Okay, so glucose doesn't mean eat sugar. It means that everything we eat gets broken down into a simple molecule called glucose. And people obviously know that eating well affects your physical health. But your brain, which only weighs 2 to 3% of your body weight, sucks up 20 to 30% of the glucose that's broken down from your diet. So about a quarter of what you eat actually goes to your thinking, not to your physical health at all. When your brain is at rest, when you're just relaxing, you're using up 20% of what you've eaten. When you're thinking really hard, you're using up to 30%. And the brain can't store glucose for later, so you need to eat regularly as well. Oxygen. Ideally, you would be moving around all day and not be in a sedentary job, but I know that most of us are, in which case going to the gym at the end of the day is better than not moving at all. Um, however, I have way too many clients that do what I call breath holding, which is kind of like they're so stressed that it looks like they're not even breathing. Just 10 deep breaths before a meeting can actually oxygenate your brain and make a really big difference to your ability to think creatively. Hydration. So we need to drink um, half a liter of water for every 15 kilograms of our body weight per day. If we don't, then the electrical and chemical messages that need to pass between our brain cells can't actually work properly, it's just physiology. By the time you're one to three percent dehydrated, your ability to remember things, concentrate, and make good decisions is depleted. And by the time you're thirsty, you're way more than three percent dehydrated. Simplicity, the reason we came here today. So, um, I suggest that we all try some form of digital detox. Whether it's one hour a day that you put your phone onto airplane mode and just actually have some time to think, or whether you start doing some email-free weekends or holidays. I started about five years ago um, doing over Easter weekend, four days, without any phone, Wi-Fi, texting, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, and it's incredible how much time and space seems to grow when you're not continually looking at your phone. I actually now um, dare to have my out-of-office notice saying I'm on a digital detox for two weeks over Christmas and New Year. I won't see your email until early January. Um, and it hasn't made me lose business. It's made people more curious and um, perhaps wanting to do the same themselves. But the real trick here from neuroscience 
is something called choice reduction. It's the reason that Mark Zuckerberg wears the same clothes every day. And it's the reason that Barack Obama observes this regime, which I suggest for everybody, but particularly working parents. Wake up at the same time every day. Do the same gym routine at the same time every day. Eat the same breakfast at the same time every day. And choose from a very, he chooses from a very narrow repertoire of clothing. I have to say that I would not want to do that, so I tend to choose what I'm wearing the night before. The reason for this is that even if you've had eight hours of good quality sleep and you've had breakfast and you've done exercise, you have a bucket of cognitive resources or your ability to think in a day which is not unlimited. Every time you make a decision, what should I wear, what should I eat, you're using up that bucket. If you're also deciding what should the children wear and what should the children eat, then by the time you've got to work, you've used up a significant amount of your bucket compared to people that don't make those decisions in the morning. And then humor. You know, I think when times are tough, when you cannot simplify things as much as you'd like to, when you really need to think smarter, not harder, laughter and humor and trust and collaboration are the things that trump everything else. No matter how hard life is, those things can get you through. They can unleash brain power that you didn't think you had. So one of the reasons for being simple is so that you can save resources for being super creative at other times. When you're being creative, you're using your language centers, your short-term memory, your imagination and insight, insight parts of your brain, and the association cortex is connecting all of those up together. So there's just so much activity going on all around the brain. To allow that to be possible at times, you need to spend enough time being mindful. In this beautiful country, of course, you get five reminders a day to go and be mindful. So mindfulness can be meditation in, in the traditional sense of the word. It can be any form of prayer. It can be doing yoga. It can just be going for a walk. I try to practice mindful eating. We've used music a lot today to sort of like build up the energy in the room, but you can also use music to really calm yourself down and be very present and escape some of the chaos around you. So the research around mindfulness activities shows that people who practice mindfulness at least three times a week for 10 to 30 minutes for eight weeks have reduced levels of the stress hormone in their body. The reason I've shown this picture of brain coral is to demonstrate that those people practicing mindfulness have increased density of folding in the outer cortex of their brain. That means that you have more of a pause button between your instinctive emotional responses to something and how you choose to think and behave in the outside world. And also that your brain goes into a gamma wave state when you're mindful. You don't get this state when you're asleep, and you don't get it when you're being task-focused. The only time you get it is when you're in a state of relaxed alertness. Research in the US Marines showed that Marines who practiced 12 minutes of mindfulness a day had increased resilience on the battlefield compared to Marines that did less than 12 minutes or no mindfulness. That's one small thing that you can do to bring simplicity into your life almost every day that doesn't take up too much time. I do mine on the London Underground, as long as I get a seat. Um, and I used to use earphones and just one of these apps or audiobooks, but I've trained myself to not use the earphones now. And I just kind of do um, some breath counting, some body scanning, and just a bit of mindfulness for 12 minutes, six tube stops. If you've enjoyed this subject, there are actually lots of really good books out there at the moment. Um, so I've put a couple there on um, neuroscience and mindfulness, which is the Buddha's brain. Although there's actually an amazing article on um, Sufi practice and mindfulness, um, which I'm sure Alper can make available to you. So Search Inside Yourself is written by Google's chief happiness officer. So you might want to think about having a chief happiness officer at your business. And Neuroscience for Leadership is my latest book, which has a strong thread of mindfulness running through it. So I have three seconds left. I'm very pleased with myself for simply having kept to time. Thank you for listening.